We're uh, in Galatians chapter 5 for today and for this entire series. And, and if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,158 and you will find Galatians chapter 5. You can follow along with us today. And uh, as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, then we want to give one of these to you. We want you to take it and read it because we know that if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, we are two-thirds of the way through our Character 101 series talking about these character traits that God is building in us, teaching us, developing in our lives as his followers. And that means if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the Holy Spirit is in you and he is committed to teaching you these character traits that we call the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things as these, there is no law. And so we are looking at these uh, character traits because God wants to teach us how to live them. And by the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, uh, these are desirable qualities anyway. You know, whether you follow Jesus or not, most people want to have more love in their life. They want to be joyful. They want to have kindness in their life. Because uh, I really don't know anyone who aspires to be unkind, impatient, and joyless. Any, anyone? That's your goal in life? Okay. See, and that's just it. We want what God offers. A lot of times, we just don't want it the way that he offers it. We want what God has for us. We just don't necessarily want to walk the path to get there, to embrace it. And yet the Holy Spirit is in us trying to teach us how to do just that. So we have to decide whether or not we're going to follow God's wisdom. We have to decide if we're going to embrace surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow him to teach us these character traits uh, because I'm pretty sure that our subject today everybody in this room desires to have it in their life we're talking about faithfulness and I'm assuming that when people look at you you hope that they are going to say hey that that person that man that woman is faithful we, we can check this out and just see uh, anyone here really want to be labeled faithless that's your goal so the uh, see we don't want to be faithless we want to be faithful Full. And so one result of surrendering your life to Jesus is faithfulness, and it grows in our lives as we surrender to him because God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, we should know this. We sing about it. We talk about it. We celebrate it. It's why we trust God, because he is faithful. Think about it. Your entire relationship with Jesus is based in this reality that God is faithful because you ask God to forgive you of your sins. You ask God to, to take you to heaven. You ask God to give you eternal life, and you are trusting him to provide that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That, that, we're trusting God. We we're, we're believe that God is faithful, and so we're placing our faith in him. And, and the scriptures Proclaim God's faithfulness too many times to read them all. In fact, I, I couldn't read them all in the time allotted for this message. So I did pick a couple of passages that I think are representative of the declarations about God's faithfulness. One from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. The, the first one is in Lamentations chapter 3. And uh, if you can find Lamentations without using your table of contents or just flipping through hoping to catch it, you're a Bible scholar. So... Um, just saying that. So you might want to try to find it. I'm not going to tell you where it is. So Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. In the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, he says this. This saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with Christ... We will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now think about that. Just in those phrases of that, of that scripture, he says, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're trusting him because 
if we've died with him, we will also live with him. I don't know if you realize this or not, but uh, we love to baptize people around here because that's how they're declaring their faith in Jesus. But baptism is a picture of death and resurrection. And when we place somebody down into the water, it's a symbol of being buried to your old way of life, dying to your old way of life and being buried with Christ and being raised to a new life, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So if we've died with Jesus, if we've given up our old and we've embraced the new, then we're going to live with him. And he says, if we endure with him, then we're going to reign with him. Jesus said it this way. He said, the one who endures to the end will be saved. We don't give up. Now he says, if you deny me, I'll deny you because Jesus actually said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. And if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Again, baptism is a picture of our confession to the world that we're an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're sitting here and you believe in Jesus, but you've never been baptized to tell people that you're a follower, then I encourage you to do that. You're going to meet God in that place. He's going to pour out his pleasure on you and just you're going to be able to celebrate the fact that you're an unashamed follower of Jesus. And then he says this to, to end it. If we are faithless, God remains faithful. It really should say when we are faithless, God remains faithful. You see, we trust God because he is faithful, not based on what we do, but because of who he is. God is faithful. What does that mean? How do we define that faithfulness? Can't cover all the aspects, so let me just share three statements, I think, that, are, that get to the very heart of God's faithfulness. God is faithful. When we say that God is faithful, what we mean is God's word is true. God's word is true. You can believe what God says. And honestly, if you don't believe this, I'm not sure why you'd follow Jesus. Because Jesus actually said these words. John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Jesus is the truth. He embodies the truth. He inspires the truth. He speaks the truth. You can trust him to be true. So our, our first essential belief here at Calvary is that we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. We believe that God inspired this and, and that all of it is true, and that's why we base our life, our teachings on this book. By the way, that's why we offer to give them to you. Because we really honestly believe that the more you read this, the more that God is going to reveal himself to you, and he's going to teach you how to live, and he's going to tell you what to believe, and you're going to understand truth, and that truth is going to change your life. Or as Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The reason so many of us live in bondage is because we don't know the truth. We know the person who's the truth, but we don't know his word. And, and let me just share this. Uh, I was 17 years old when, when uh, I said yes to God, I'm going to be in ministry for my life. And, uh, and my brother gave me a Bible that I could read. In other words, it wasn't a King James Version that I'd grown up with. It was a New American Standard Version, and I started reading it, and I understood it, and I devoured it, and, and uh, I marked it all up and wrote all in it and, and everything like that. And God started changing my life and started teaching me his wisdom. And you know what I discovered is that you can trust what God says. And the more you build your life on his word, the more blessings you're going to walk into and the more wisdom you're going to find because God is way wiser than we are. Way wiser than we are. His word is true. And I found that, you know, and I'll just tell you this. I, yeah, I went to school forever and a day, 10 years of higher education, but the way that God really taught me is through this book. If you want wisdom in your life, you want blessings, then understand that God's word is true and you can trust what he says. You can trust God's word. God is faithful means that God's word is true and God's character is consistent. God's character is consistent. Uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. What they're talking about is his character is consistent. And we love consistency, don't we? That's why we go to the same restaurants over and over and over again. You guys do that? You go to the place, you have a favorite restaurant? How many of you, if I say we're going to this restaurant, you don't even have to look at the menu. You know right away what you're going to order off that menu. Because you order the same thing every single time. God bless rut eaters. I'm one of you. Okay. I don't understand the people, you know, my wife, she drives me crazy. We go to, you know, the same restaurant. She knows the menu by heart. 
and she has to look at it again. <laughs> I mean, as soon as we decide on the restaurant, I know what I'm getting. Because that's good, and it's consistent, and you trust it. It really irritates you when they take that item off the menu. Because <laughs> you're like, I don't even know if I can go back to that restaurant anymore. They changed the menu. How, how could they do it? See, we, we love consistency. And God's character is unchanging. God's character is unchanging. That means that God always loves us. He always loves us. Hey, when you were a kid, did you ever, and, and, and this is probably, I think, a generational thing, did you ever pick a flower and then do the whole, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not, Okay. Some of you that are younger are shaking your head like, what is that? You have to go outside to find flowers. Um, so <laughs> it's all right. But here's the thing with God. It's he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. When you're not feeling worthy, God still loves you. When you fail, God still loves you. When you rebel, God still loves you. His character is unchanging and he loves you, period. Today, if you're feeling unloved, God loves you. He always loves. He's always righteous. He's always holy. He's always good. He's always merciful. His character is unchanging, which is why we can't just change the definition of truth. We can't just change the definition of right and wrong or good and bad based on how we feel or how we want things to be. Because God is true, and God's character is consistent. That's why we can trust God. And God is faithful because God is working for redemption. You see, we trust God to forgive our sins and adopt us as children because Jesus died for us, okay? We've already talked about that. That's why, where that relationship of trust begins, but it doesn't end there. Your decision to follow Jesus is not like, okay, I'm in, so I don't have to worry about it. No, it keeps growing because God is still working in your life today to redeem your life. Whether you are living for him or you're in rebellion, whether you are, are experiencing pain and a struggle or victory, God is with you and he's for you and he's working to redeem your life, to take the broken pieces and the rebellion and the pain and to make something beautiful in your life, to build his kingdom and to glorify his name. He's doing that in your life today. And we know this because the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 tells us this. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there's a lot of pain in our life. There's a lot of hurt in our life. There's a lot of destruction in our life. God's not the cause of that. God's the redeemer of that. He's the one who's there with you in the midst of your brokenness saying, we're going to fix this. We're going to redeem this. We're going to heal this. We're going to go ahead and, and take the broken pieces of your life and make them into a beautiful picture of God's power to redeem. So God is faithful. We can trust him completely. So I have to pause just for a moment and ask you, do you trust God? Have you found him faithful? Because following Jesus is about learning to trust him more and more each day. And some days it feels like God is asking us to jump off a cliff. And some days it just feels like God's asking us to step off a curb. But in your walk with God, are you trusting him more and more each day? And some of you haven't yet crossed the line of trusting God. Some of you are here and you're like, yeah, I like God and I like what I see and I, and I hear all this stuff, but you're still trying to be good enough to earn your salvation. You're still trying to say, hey, I hope I can make it. And you're not relying on Jesus to take care of you and to do what you can. Because to become a follower of Jesus, it essentially means you have to stand before God and say, I can't do this myself. I am helpless and I am hopeless without you. Will you please do what I can't do? Will you give me eternal life? Will you forgive my sins? Will you save me from hell? And he will. Because he is faithful. You can trust him. And so if you haven't yet crossed that line of trusting God, I'm just going to invite you right now just to... Just Stop listening to me and start talking to God and just simply say, Jesus, I surrender. 
I, I, I want you to take control of my life. I want to follow you. Just do that. If you need to talk with someone, right after the service, our prayer team is going to be here at the front. They'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Pastors will be at the Connection Centers. You can go and find one and just say, hey, talk to me more about trusting Jesus. I want to follow him. You see, God is faithful. And we want to be faithful. So let's talk about a faithful life. I mean, what, is, what does that look like? We, we know it when we see it in somebody else, right? We go, wow, look at them. They're faithful. But what does that look like in us? Because we know like, it's on the inside. And, and so if we're going to be faithful, then, then how do we really determine what that is? And, and I'm just going to share with you three statements that you can use to evaluate your life. And, and uh, I'm not going to evaluate your life. The people around you aren't going to evaluate your life. This is for you and God to have a conversation. The Holy Spirit's here. He's in you. And, and he's going to take these. And you guys just kind of evaluate your faithful life. So here it is. A faithful life, first of all, speaks the truth. Speaks the truth. Uh, so many scriptures affirm this. I mean, Moses, you know, in the Ten Commandments said, uh, don't bear false witness. The Apostle Paul talked about speaking the truth. Jesus is really clear. So in the middle of Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, in other words, be clear and be true. You shouldn't need a lawyer to kind of parse your words to find out what you actually said. It, it should be obvious by your words what you mean. So let me just ask you this. Are your words true? Are they encouraging? Are they uplifting? Are they pointing people to Jesus? Or are they filled with gossip and slander and innuendo and accusation or just outright lies? Are your words true? You see, a faithful person speaks the truth in love. And not your version of the truth. You know what I'm saying? I, I hope you understand there's a difference between your opinions and the truth. Can, can I just say that? And, and it's true for me as well. Everyone in this room, ha, we have opinions, right? And we believe in our opinions. We want to share our opinions. Ask us our opinions. We'll tell you what we think about everything. But there is a difference between your opinion and truth. Can I just say that? And, and if you don't know that, you're going to be really annoying <laughs> and wrong. Okay, because God is true. And, and, and if you want to speak truth, then this needs to be in your life because this is what allows you to speak truth. And the more you put this in your life, the more truth is going to come out your mouth. And so understand the difference between God's word and your opinion uh, because God's word is true. And a faithful life speaks the truth. Uh, Secondly, a faithful life lives out convictions. Lives out convictions. The Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 3, and this is so broad, it covers everything. I, I love this. He just kind of says, and whatever you do, <laughs> whatever you do, word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Isn't that cool? Hey, whatever you do, if it involves words or if it involves actions, uh, do it with Jesus. Do it with Jesus. Take him with you. Have him along with you. Identify the fact that you're a follower of Jesus and represent him and give glory to God while you're doing it. So, do you ever say one thing and do another? Yeah, we all do, don't we? You see, that's character inconsistency. And if you don't practice what you preach, then what are you? What are you practicing if you don't practice what you preach? You're practicing hypocrisy. And we're all hypocrites at some point in our life. You know, think about it. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, some funny stuff. But, you know, I, I drink Diet Pepsi, and, and it is on a regular basis that somebody warns me about drinking Diet Pepsi. They just, oh, that stuff's going to kill you. And I'm like, yeah, i got to die from something, and I'm going to heaven, so, so what? Uh, <laughs> And, and see, it doesn't bother me at all. You want to you challenge me about diabetes? I, I don't care. I'm going to drink it anyway, so uh, go ahead. But see, what I love is the fact that it, when somebody goes on a rant about how, what you should do or your health and stuff like that, I just love them to watch them and kind of go, hey, that's not good for you either. Right? You ever have someone lecture you on what you should eat and then they, you catch them eating a Twinkie? 
That is a perfect moment right there, right? Oh, I see. So that's organic and on your diet. I, I get it. You know, because, you know, then, it, then it's kind of fun. But see, we do that in life, and we, and we kind of go, hey, uh, you know, you should do this, you should do that. And then we turn around, and we do the opposite. You know, that whole do as I say, not as I do stuff doesn't work with your kids, and it doesn't work for your witness. You see, this entire series is really about character consistency. See, one of the core values at Calvary is, is simply character. We cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And the Holy Spirit's trying to teach us the character of Christ. And, and so if your actions don't match your convictions, change your actions or change your convictions. And by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't get to decide what your convictions are. Jesus has already told us what our convictions are. He spelled them out in the Word of God. And when you said yes to Jesus, what you said was, hey, it's no longer what I think, it's what you think. And it's no longer my convictions. I don't get to decide those. You decide those. And so we live out His convictions. And so change your actions or change your convictions. Follow Jesus or drop the label. I'm not a label guy. I don't know if you guys are. It doesn't really matter whether you are or not, but I don't care about labels. You know, the only thing I care about with clothes is whether they are comfortable. You know, in other words, it's not tight. I'm happy. Okay, I, I'm, just, I'm just being honest. I, I would live my life in sweatpants and jerseys if I could get away with it uh, because I just really, if they could come up with clothes that didn't touch you, it'd be perfect. And, and so I don't care what I, what I look like, and my wife does, thank God for her, but uh, I don't care about labels. And, and so it doesn't matter to me what kind of labels. I never go, oh, what labels on that shirt? I just go, does it fit? You know, and, that, and that's all I care about. But, uh, but there are people who care about labels. And so they want to go, oh, you know, I have a designer this or I have that. And, and you know what I found is you can go to China and you can buy something with uh, any label you want on it for 10 bucks. And you know what? And, and it looks good for a little while. And, uh, but it's a fake. And there are people who love to label themselves all different kinds of things and tell you what their labels are. And, and here's the truth. You hang out with them for a little bit and you're going to know what they really are. And there's a lot of people who self-identify. You know, I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Christian. I've got the label on. I sewed it on myself. It's there. Can I just tell you that God really doesn't care what your label is? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Plain and simple. He just is really blunt. God does not feel compelled to honor the labels that we attach to ourselves. The label that he gives us is what matters. So let's follow Jesus, or let's drop the label, let's be honest, let's live our convictions. And, and again, I say this knowing that every one of us fails. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is naturally faithless. And so while I'm saying this, I know the words are harsh, but at the same time, we celebrate God's amazing grace because he loves us anyway, and he's with us anyway, and he's cheering for us to do better. See, the Holy Spirit is leading us toward Jesus. We're not there yet. We're on this journey, and, and here's my question, because we're following Jesus, and he doesn't expect perfection. He expects improvement, but are you even trying? Are you even trying? Are you making progress? Do you see it in your life? Can you look back and go, look how far I've come. Look what I've learned. Look, look how different my life is because of Jesus, or are you just stuck in the same place? Are you trying? Are you reading the Bible? Are you joining a life group? Are you going to celebrate recovery? Are you getting some counseling? Are you volunteering to serve? Are you doing anything to try and make a difference in your life? You know, the only people that Jesus was really harsh towards were the religious people who claimed a relationship with God and didn't live it out. He called them hypocrites. A faithful life lives out convictions. And right now, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to a lot of his children in this room. Can I just encourage you to listen to him? 
and repent and follow him because he wants to lead you to life. He wants to teach you faithfulness. So a faithful life speaks the truth, lives out convictions, and serves God. A faithful life serves God. Uh, you know, in Scripture, it's really clear that we are identified as servants of God. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you're a servant of God, and faithful servants must do what to be faithful? Serve. <laughs> right? Faithful servants have to serve. If you're a servant, you got to serve. And, and so if this is way too broad a topic, I'm going to talk about two things about faithful servants. First of all, if you're going to be a faithful servant, you got to love and lead your family. Love and lead your family. The first position of responsibility that any of us are given in the kingdom of God is family. Let me say that again. The very first responsibility that God gives you is family. And, and, and in fact, one of the qualifications of being a leader in God's church is leading your family. And, and so we take this really seriously at Calvary. And we talk about it all the time. We want you to lead your family. We want you to love your family. And I think that's where the real beginning point of significance in following Jesus is when you love your family better. And so that means if you're married, live up to your wedding vows. Be faithful with your wedding vows. And yes, that means that you don't cheat on your spouse. You don't commit adultery. But it doesn't stop there. Because see, some of you are like, I'm faithful because uh, I, I don't cheat. Great. I'm glad you don't cheat. But it doesn't end there. There's more to it. Are you actively loving your spouse? Men, are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? That involves sacrifice. That involves serving. That involves caring for and protecting and building up and helping and blessing. In fact, Paul went on to say the man who loves his wife loves himself. So are you investing in that relationship and helping her to become the woman that God created her to be? And wives, are you loving your husbands actively? Are, are you helping him to be the man that God created him to be? Are, are you investing in him? Are you encouraging him? And by the way, nagging every day is not encouragement. <laughs> Just, it, you know, think about this. And, and are you actively loving your children and by that, I mean, are you encouraging your kids? Are you blessing your kids? Are you disciplining your kids? Are you leading your children to Jesus? You know, I, uh, I really respect Julie and her decision. I don't have to like her decision, but I, I respect her decision because she's making it based on this understanding that family is the first responsibility that God gives us. And she could not figure out how to balance the ministry at Calvary and her responsibilities as a wife and a mom, and she chose the better thing. Can I just say that? She chose right. She chose correctly. She honored God by saying, my first calling is to be a wife and a mom, and i got to do that better. I think God's going to honor her. He's going to bless us. Uh, I don't worry about that, but I just, I see that, and I'm just so thankful for her heart in doing that. You see, your example is impacting your children. Are you leading them toward Jesus, honestly, or are you leading them away? So if we're going to be faithful servants, we've got to love and lead our family. And if we're going to be faithful servants, then we have to influence effectively. Uh, there's a great parable, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. It's called the Parable of the Talents. Matthew 25 is a chapter you should go home and read. I encourage that last week, leaning into the last parable. This, today, I just encourage you to go home. And really, I encourage you to read this parable several times this week and let God speak to you. Uh, I'm not going to read it right now. I'm going to just summarize it real quickly. It, it's like this. There's a master, and he, and he says, hey, I'm going away on a trip, and I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming back. Uh, and... Uh, he, he takes his servants and he gives them different sums of money. And to the first one, he gives five talents of money, which is a huge amount of money. And to the second one, he gives two talents of money, which is a huge amount of money. To the third one, he gives one talent of money, which is still a huge amount of money. And he says, bye, I'll be back. And the first servant takes the five talents and he goes out and he earns five more talents. And the second servant goes out and takes his two talents and earns two more talents. And the third servant is afraid, so he goes and buries the talent in the ground. Master comes home, says to the first servant, what'd you do? He says, Master, I earned five more talents. Here's 10 talents. And he says, 
well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. I will put you in charge of much. The second one gets the same thing. Master, I had two. Uh, here's two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. The third servant, master, I was afraid, so I hit it in the ground. Here's your money back. You wicked, lazy servant. He said you could have at least put it at, you know, at the bank and I'd had a little bit of interest getting it back. It did not end well for servant number three. Now, if you grew up in church, you were probably exposed to a terrible falsehood about faithfulness. I heard it my whole life growing up. I still hear people say it today. It goes like this. Faithfulness is abstaining from evil and showing up. Faithfulness is not sinning and attending church. Hmm. Which one of the servants does that sound like to you? You wicked, lazy servant. You see, from Jesus, faithfulness is equated with effective servants. Effective service. So you had five, you earned five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You had two, you made two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. He's saying, hey, because your life was fruitful, you're making a difference. And we're talking about influencing people for the kingdom of God. We're talking about using the gifts and abilities that God has given you to build and to bless and to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So understand that life itself is a gift from God that you have right now. And, and, and all of the stuff you have, all the money you have, is a gift from God to you right now. And, and all of the talents and abilities and energy and creativity that you have right now is given to you by God. And all of the people in your life that you relate to, that you have influence with, are given to you by God. And He's asking you as His servants to be faithful. Who are you influencing toward the kingdom of God? Who are you leading toward Jesus right now? Or is your life leading them away? How are you using your talents and abilities, your creativity and your energy to build up the kingdom of God, to bless people in Jesus' name? How are you using the resources that God has given you abundantly to build up the kingdom of God and bless people in Jesus' name? You see, would Jesus declare your life faithful? I mean, if you met him tomorrow, are you going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Now, I ask that question, and I realize it's a hard question. And I ask it because it's the question that drives my life. I want my life at the end to be declared by Jesus to be faithful. And so I live to that effect. And, and here's the thing. As your pastor, I want your life at the end to be declared faithful by Jesus. I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want you to receive that reward. And, and so I, I'm sharing with you, here's, here's how Scripture describes faithfulness. And if we're not being faithful, it's time to start. Because God's mercies are new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. And the Holy Spirit is in you and he's saying, come on, we can do this. We can be faithful. You can invest in people. You can change the way that you love your spouse. I can redeem your marriage. I can redeem your family. I can bless you. You can live differently. You can love differently. But it means that we have to say, okay, God, I'm going to do this your way. Because I want to be faithful. The Holy Spirit is teaching He's calling, he's convicting, he's challenging. Right now, what does God the Holy Spirit want you to do with your life? He wants us all to be faithful. Let's pray.